Welcome to Calvary Church. We're so glad that you're here. It's a good day. It's a happy day. We have the choir and orchestra here to lead us in worship. We're in the middle of our Captivated series, and today we're focusing on the once and for all sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. Would you stand as we celebrate what he's done for us? Greatest day in history, death is beaten, you have rescued me, sing it out. Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out. Jesus is alive. He's alive. Jesus is alive.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for rising to your feet and singing out, and uh, what a great start to our morning together. My name is Bo Eckert. I'm the senior pastor here at Calvary Church, and I just want to welcome all of you here today. Um, now, for many of us, maybe it was unexpected, but you drove here today and you were greeted by piles of dirt and some bulldozers, so you see that the, the parking project has begun. So thank you for your patience. We are literally taking a step back for a few weeks so that we can take about five steps forward. We're adding over 200 parking spaces that should be done uh, before the winter freeze comes. So uh, over these next couple weeks, just going to need to be even more patient than we normally are in the parking lot. So thanks for, uh, for helping us out there. Um, but we're excited to, to add those spots and, and uh, what it's going to do for us here uh, on Sunday mornings at Calvary Church. If you're here today for the very first time, I hope that you have been warmly welcomed and greeted by those around you and those as you've walked in the door. I would love to be able to connect with you, would love to be able to have a, a conversation with you about Calvary Church. Tough to do in this environment, but we can do it in what we call our welcome gathering. Immediately following this service, out the auditorium doors, take a right. There's a room down there that says welcome gathering. It'll take about 10 minutes of your time, just a place for you to ask some questions, for us to introduce you to, to Calvary Church, tell you a little bit more about who we are and what we're doing here. So um, whether it's your first time here, you've been here a few times, we would love to connect with you there uh, at the welcome gathering. As always, right after this service, we will be serving lunch in Fellowship Hall, so I hope you can join us today uh, for that time of, of fellowship uh, right when we're finished here. As always, we gave you a bulletin when you walked in the door, lots of information in that bulletin about things that are happening at Calvary Church. Let me highlight just a couple for you. Uh, this Tuesday night, our tapestry ministry, uh, which is a, a ministry that involves adoption, foster care, uh, our, our safe families ministry, which provides temporary relief or respite care for families that are in crisis. This Tuesday night, we're going to have a panel that's going to talk more about uh, the, the, the opportunities that are there for families in Calvary Church uh, to be a part of this. So if you're interested in adoption, foster or this uh, respite care, this, this relief for families in crisis. Uh, Tuesday night is the night to come, 7 o'clock, room 320. There'll be some local agencies that'll be here. There'll be some families that are a part uh, of this already to get your questions answered. So even if it's just something that you've even thought about, uh, if you can make it out this Tuesday night, more information about that in the bulletin. Also in your bulletin, I would ask each of you now to reach in there and take out the Thanksgiving offering insert. Uh, for those of you that are a regular part of Calvary Church, you know all about this. Uh, this is the time of year when there's often opportunities to give above and beyond your regular giving. There's other uh, organizations and things that are, that are looking for uh, some special giving opportunities this time of year. The Thanksgiving offering is one of the ways that we do that here at Calvary Church. So we kick it off today uh, and we'll uh, have the opportunity to give over these next uh, couple weeks. Um, there's several ways that you can give towards the Thanksgiving offering. You can just mark it on your check. If you use our envelopes, there's a special envelope for Thanksgiving offering. You can go online there's a drop-down box in the online option that you can uh, earmark it for Thanksgiving offering. Or if you join us on our Thanksgiving Day uh, 10 o'clock service, uh, the offering that day all goes towards uh, the Thanksgiving offering. But just to orient you, if you're looking at that uh, insert now, uh, on the front side, it talks about the, some of the gifts that we uh, have towards some of our global partners and some of the work that they're doing. Um, and then global partners and staff Christmas gifts. These are modest yet meaningful financial gifts for our global partners and, and for our staff. On the back, this is what I would encourage you to spend some time reading over. These are local organizations that we partner with. It's as if we've gone and we've vetted some good local organizations that are doing great gospel-centered work uh, in lots of different areas, helping the, the, the poor and the homeless, uh, helping those with medical needs, uh, helping refugees, helping those that have been a part of um, human trafficking. You can read through what these organizations do and, and what the gifts that we give this year uh, will, will go towards that. So if you make a donation to the Thanksgiving offering, um, you can see uh, what our, our goal there is for each of those organizations. Um, and then if we reach our total goal for the Thanksgiving offering, anything above and beyond it goes towards the debt reduction here at Calvary Church. You'll also notice on the bottom of the back side, there's some additional giving opportunities. These are separate from the Thanksgiving offering, but we wanted to present it to you all at once. We'll do the giving tree, which we've done the last couple years. More information about that in weeks to come. 
And then for you to consider end of year giving. Uh, we know w with the way some of you prefer to give, you get to the end of the, the calendar year and there's uh, giving that comes and, and, and this end of the year giving can be go towards a specific uh, project that's happening here at Calvary Church. We'll be happy to talk with you about that. But really, this is a great way for us to continue to, 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 to strengthen, to continue to fund our, our regular um, ministry budgets here at Calvary Church. So uh, I hope you consider both a Thanksgiving offering and an end of year gift. So more information about all of that uh, as we go over these next couple weeks. Now, finally... Because we are a family, we're a large church, but we're a family, we still come and we rejoice with those that are rejoicing and we mourn with those that are mourning, and today is a little bit of a time of mourning for Calvary Church. Um, yesterday, one of our longtime global partners, John Fogel, went home to be with the Lord after a long battle with cancer. Um, so we will pray and we'll continue to pray and support Dawn and the rest of the family. Um, his service, memorial service, celebration of life service will be this coming Saturday, November 5th at 11 a.m. down in the lower auditorium. Not in this room, not in the chapel, but down in the lower auditorium. You can contact the church this week for more information about that. In just a moment, our ushers are going to come. We're going to receive our morning offering, but let's turn and let's look to the Lord. Let's pray together now. Father, today our hearts hurt at the news of the passing of our dear brother, John Fogel. Would you please bring your peace and your comfort to all of us who grieve, but especially for Dawn, for the kids, and for the rest of the family. But as we grieve, we don't do it without hope, because we know the ultimate reality of our eternal relationship with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. During these days when this family will begin to experience a new normal, may they draw near to you, may they hold fast to their confession of hope, and may they encourage one another in the Lord. And Father, we pray the same for the many others in this church who are or have experienced a similar loss. And as we mourn with these families, we think of another family here in the church, Guy and Carolyn Eshelman. Thank you for preserving Philip's life, their son Philip's life, in the accident several weeks ago. And even though he has a long road of recovery still ahead, we rejoice with the progress that he continues to make. Thank you for how your grace and your people have sustained Guy and Carolyn and the rest of the family through this trying time. Father, there are many times in life when we don't feel like we have much more than your sustaining grace. But as your word says, it is enough. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your prayer, Pastor Bo. We want to continue in our time of worship together. And a little later on in the service, we're going to be taking communion. And we're going to have the opportunity to reflect on Christ's body that was broken for us and the blood that he shed for us. His love is so deep. So as we are gathering the offering, if you wanna just reflect or sing along to these words of, oh, the blood, feel free to join in. No, the blood, crimson love, Christ of life's deep. Of every man. 
Would you stand and sing with us?
week number six of our captivated series, working our way through the book of Hebrews. We've passed the halfway point, six down, five to go. And as we begin today, I just want to ask you a couple questions. It's a good time to just kind of pull back. And I want to ask you, how has this series been for you? For those that have been here week after week, do you understand the letter of Hebrews a little bit better than you did when we started? Do you understand Jesus better and what Jesus has done for us? Has it encouraged you to hold fast, to not drift, to keep believing? Has it made any practical difference in your life? From time to time, we need to ask ourselves those questions because I'm afraid if we don't, then all we're doing here is just going through the motions. And we don't want to just go through the motions because if we're not intentional in looking into God's word and understanding what he's done for us and understanding life from a biblical perspective, we will drift. We will fade away and we will stop believing. So I hope that you're wrestling through what we've been talking about and thinking about how it applies to your life because this is a challenging book. It's a challenging book to work through, and one of the main reasons why it's so challenging is this was written to a group of believers that are coming with a Jewish background mindset, and for most of us, we don't have that. So we don't, by our very nature, understand the, the high priest and the sacrificial system in the Old Covenant, so we've had to kind of work through that and explain that and, and, and make this so that we can understand it in our current cultural Context. So we're going to continue to do that today as we look together at Hebrews chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. It's found on page 1006 in the Pew Bible that is in front of you. And as you're turning there, I want you to think along these lines with me. I was thinking about this this week as I worked through this chapter. Many of you would have what we in the Christian community call a life verse something that you attach there at the bottom of the email or you put it as a, a quote in, at, at the bottom of a note that you would write to somebody or you've got it framed and hanging on your wall or you know, something like that highlighted in your Bible. But have you ever thought about and do any of you have a life chapter, a chapter of the Bible that you would say, that's my life chapter? Or let me ask it this way. I know this would never happen, hypothetical, but let's just say it would. If somebody would come to you and say, for the rest of your life, you only have access to one chapter from the Bible, and you get to pick the chapter that it would be, what chapter would you pick? As I thought about that, there was a couple that immediately came to mind, and I kind of narrowed it down to maybe a top five and maybe a top three. Hebrews chapter 10 is clearly, would clearly be in my top five, if not my top three, if not maybe number one on the list. And here's why. Let me give you the overview of this chapter, and then we're going to dig in to it. It really has four parts to it, as we're going to look at it this morning. It starts with a reminder of Jesus, that once and for all sacrifice of what he has done for us. So it reminds us of what Jesus has done and what we're believing in when it comes to, to what he has accomplished for us. Once we talk through that, we're going to pause and we're going to take communion. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to finish the rest of the chapter. I want you to know that right up front because through the years we have conditioned you that we take communion here at Calvary Church at the end, then we finish, we sing a brief song, and out the door you go. I don't want that to happen today or I'll be standing up here by myself trying to finish the message. <laughs> message part one, communion, message part two. So don't go anywhere. Um, it'll all be pretty self-explanatory. We'll work it through together, and, uh, and everything will be fine. Um, but he starts by talking about Jesus as that once and for all sacrifice. Then he goes on and tells us how to live the Christian life. Then he warns us to continue to persevere and to press on, and he ends with a final bit of encouragement. It's a wonderful chapter that helps us to understand who he is, what he's done, and how we are to live. We're going to dig deep. We're going to go through this quickly, 
By the end of it, what I'm going to want you to do is go back and spend some time, whether it's today or tomorrow, and just work through it again after we've taught through it today. And I trust that this will be an encouragement to all of us. Let's begin with Jesus as that once and for all sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 says this. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities. Let's pause right there. What he's saying is a shadow points to something bigger, better, more grand than the shadow in and of itself. A shadow is an outline. It gives you the the general idea of what is casting the shadow. So he talks about the law and particularly the sacrificial system as a shadow of the reality that's going to come. Any Mary Poppins fans? Do you remember the beginning of Mary Poppins when Bert is there on the sidewalk and he's drawing, you know, art on the sidewalk and he's got kind of a frame spot on the sidewalk and Mary Poppins shows up. He doesn't look up, but her shadow lands right in that framed area. And you know what Bert says to her? He doesn't look up at her. He says, don't move a muscle. I know that silhouette anywhere. It's Mary Poppins. It's my best Cockney British accent. I've been working on it all week. Don't ask me to do it again. But do you remember that? He doesn't even have to look up and see her face. He knows from the shadow that it's Mary Poppins. He knows what the shadow is pointing to, but he doesn't see the reality. He doesn't see the detail of what's happening. And the author is saying that's what the Old Testament sacrificial system would do and should do. It pointed people to the greater sacrifice that God had in mind, but it was always going to fall short. It could never accomplish God's ultimate plan. And he goes on and he tells us what that plan is in the rest of verse 1. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, the same sacrifice that the priest, priest offers over and over and over again, it could never make perfect those who draw near. When it says make per- per- perfect, it doesn't necessarily mean makes them flawless. It's talking about their relationship with God. It could never do what it needed to do to bring us back into right relationship between God and man. The shadow can't do what the reality was meant to do and to accomplish. If it could, if the shadow could, if the Old Testament sacrificial system could, there would have been never a reason to do away with it. There would have been never a reason for Jesus to come. Look what he says in verse 2. Otherwise, if it could make the, the person drawing near, if it could make them perfect in their relationship with God, would they not have ceased to be offered? since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have consciousness of sin. If it could take care of sin, if it could clear their conscience, it would have never needed to be done away with. But since it couldn't do that, the greater needed to come. But here's what that system did for them. Look at verse 3. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every day year. It didn't clear their conscience of sin. The sacrificial system actually became a reminder over and over and over again of the fact that they fall short. Verse 4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. God brought that sacrificial system so he could overlook, so he could point forward to the ultimate sacrifice that would take away sin, but it always served as that reminder. It was messy. It was something that needed to be repeated over and over and over again. Some of us are old enough to remember the old chalkboards in a classroom. 
Some of you were assigned the responsibility to take chalk erasers and clap them at the end of the day and there's dust flying everywhere. Remember what it was like to erase an old chalkboard. No matter how hard you worked and no matter how hard you scrubbed with that eraser, there was always a remnant of what was written on the board that remained. Sometimes you remember your teacher would write something and then erase it and then write something else and erase it and you've got two or three layers of buildup of kind of what's underneath and you could kind of make it out but not really see and sometimes even after the board was erased you could look and you could still see what was written there and you use the eraser and the eraser could never really do away with it and you clap the erasers and it's all dusty and all dirty. Similar to that was the Old Testament sacrificial system. Just like those erasers could, could, could wipe it, it was never meant to, to take away and be done with it. So what did you have to do at the end of the day or the end of the week? And some of you were assigned this. You had to get a bucket of water. You had to get a sponge. You had to get a rag. And you had to come and you had to wipe that board clean. That sponge with the water would come and do what those chalk erasers never were able to do. In a similar way, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sins. As a result, God had another plan. God had his ultimate plan that that shadow pointed to in mind. So verse 5 says this. Consequently, because that wasn't the original plan, consequently, here is the plan. Here is the ultimate plan that that shadow pointed towards. And the author of Hebrews quoting Psalm 40, and it's as if Jesus is speaking Psalm 40, and he says this, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. Then later it says, in burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. If he did, if that old system could get the job done, there would be no need for Jesus to come. If the erasers could get it taken care of, there'd be no need to come with the sponge to wipe it away. But because that system couldn't get it taken care of, look what Jesus says the author says that Jesus is saying, in quoting Psalm 40, right in the middle, but a body have you prepared for me. Jesus says, in order to accomplish what you ultimately want to be accomplished, the full removal of sins, you have given me a body to complete what he needed to accomplish. Many of you tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up and you're going to put on a uniform, an outfit, protective gear, something that you need to wear to complete your job, to complete what you have to do in your place of work. When I played college football, I put on a helmet and shoulder pads and cleats and got all taped up so that things didn't fall apart when I'm out there fulfilling my role as the quarterback of the football team. I had to be prepared to do that. We have somebody here in the church that's, that works as an underwater welder. And he has to put on a special helmet and breathing apparatus in order to complete his job. Jesus needed a body to fulfill and complete the job that God had set aside for him to do. The once and for all sacrifice. Look at the end of this. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will. Given me a body so that I can accomplish your will so that I can accomplish what you want me to do. The atonement explains the incarnation. The atonement explains the incarnation. When people say, why did Jesus come? Why did he come to earth? Oh, it was to be a good teacher. It was to set a good example. He did a lot of good things. He fed people. He healed people, etc. All of those things are true. But why was Jesus given a body to come to planet Earth? It was to offer himself so that he could be that once and for all sacrifice. Look at verse 10. And by that will, by the will of God, we, all of us, have benefited because we have been sanctified 
Paul says in Thessalonians, this is the will of God, your sanctification for you, not just to be saved and forgiven, but to be set apart for his will to be done in your life. By that will, we have been sanctified. How? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ over and over again? No, once for all. That's what Jesus has accomplished when God gave him a body, incarnation, came here to planet Earth. Look at verse 11. The author is driving this home for us. Every priest stands daily. There was no place for him to sit. Why? Because he had to offer repeatedly the same sacrifices over and over and over. Why did he have to offer them over and over and over? Because they could never take away sins. We might not understand that. Here's what this might look like for you and I. We go through the motions religiously. People all around the world do lots of religious things on a daily basis, offering repeatedly good works, good deeds, sacrifices, jumping through hoops. Why? Because they're trying to appease God, trying to make God happy, trying to deal with their problem of sin. That's what he's saying here in verse 11 on the left side. Then look at the contrast. I'm going to put it right next to it on verse 12. But that's good news. When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice not repeatedly for sins he sat down at the right hand of God what does the priest do the priest stands daily why because his work is never finished why did Jesus sit down because his work is done the price has been paid the once and for all sacrifice has taken care of it for all time for all of us. He sat down, not just because his work was finished, but if you keep reading, he sat down because that's the place of authority. His work is done. He's in the place of authority until he returns. Nothing else needs to to, to happen. Nothing else needs to be finished. Your relationship status with God is taken care of because of the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. Normally, at this point in the message, I would come up with some slick visual or physical illustration to help drive home the point that the author is making. No need for me to do that. Do you know why? Because Jesus has already given us one. He's given us the Lord's table. Have you ever thought about communion that way, that that's what it is? It's a physical, tangible illustration reminder of what Jesus has done for us. And this passage might shed light on communion for you in a way that you've never thought about it before. What did the sacrificial system remind the people of over and over and over again? It reminded them of their sins. What are we supposed to do when we come to the communion table? We're supposed to remember our sins? No, we remember what Jesus did for us in his sacrifice for our sins. What did Jesus say when he took that piece of bread? This is my body. God gave him a body in order for him to do what he needed to do to accomplish that once and for all sacrifice. The piece of bread, it's not Jesus' actual body. It's just a reminder, physical, tangible reminder of what he's done for us. The, the, The cups of juice, not his actual blood, but a reminder that his blood is what cleanses us and washes us away. So we're going to pause right now in the middle of this message, in the middle of this chapter, and we're going to take and we're going to receive communion together. The musicians are going to come. I'm going to come down. And as we take communion together to remind us of this once and for all sacrifice, I know there's lots of kids in the room today. Parents, you understand where your child is and if they understand what we're doing. And if not, Take this as an opportunity to explain to them what we're doing, and uh, if they want to participate, absolutely. If you're not a member of Calvary Church, that's okay. If you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is for you as well. Uh, Our tradition, our custom here is that we will distribute the bread, we'll hold that, we'll come back together, and then we'll take that together, and then we'll do the same with the cup. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for giving Jesus a body 
so that he could come and take care of the problem of sin that the blood of bulls and goats could never take care of. Thank you that you've given us this physical, tangible reminder of what he has done for us. Thank you for his broken body on the cross, died for us, rose again to affirm what he's done, removing and taking away our sin. We remember, we worship, we give you thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. Apostle Paul gives us instruction on what Jesus did on that night when he gave us this physical, tangible reminder. He said, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and eat together. Paul goes on to tell us that in the same way, Jesus took the cup. So let's give thanks for the blood of Jesus that washes away our sin. Father, thank you that in the fact that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin, you provided a better way, the ultimate way for that to take place, and it was the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we never trample on that sacrifice and on what he has done for us. But may we trust, may we believe, may we give thanks, may we worship as a result. Thank you that the blood of Jesus washes away our sin once for all. Amen.
tells us in the same way, also he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, not the old covenant, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take and drink together. Were you listening to the words of that song that we sang once and for all? Let's stand to our feet now. Let's sing uh, that song in response to what we've just done. Once and for all, our debt is paid. There on the cross, it is finished. The Lamb of God for us was slain. And out from the grave, He is risen. Out from the grave, He is risen. We believe that God is Jesus. We believe that He is just experienced and remembered and worshiped and gave thanks for. Okay, did we lose anybody? It doesn't look like it. All right, let's, uh, let's keep working our way through this. Um, as I said, normally we take communion and then out the door we go. It's almost a proverbial illustration for what we often do when we think about what Jesus has done for us with his sacrifice. Without even thinking about it, some of us say, I understand that Jesus died for me. I understand that he rose again. Thank you for doing that. I've got the rest covered from here. I can get through life. I can work through the struggles that I have. I can get through what's happening. Thanks for doing what you did. Here I go from here. It's almost like that's what we say when we take communion and then boom, out the door we go. But that's not what the author of Hebrews does here in chapter 10. He tells us and he starts with a wonderful word in scripture and it's the word therefore. Therefore. In verse 19, he says, therefore. As a result of what Jesus has done for you, here's now how you are to live. And again, it's a struggle for us to understand that Old Testament sacrificial system. So I was groping, thinking about an illustration this week. And so here's what I thought about. I said, what is it that we do over and over and over again? As Scott said last week, there's hopefully none of us that are sacrificing animals on a regular basis thinking that that's somehow covering over our sins. I know some of you are hunters and, you know, that's all well and good, and, but you're not doing that for some sort of sacrifice. So that's not something that's a regular part of, of, of our thinking. What are things that we do over and over again? So I started thinking about, okay, there's money that we pay over and over again. Many of us, most of us, pay a mortgage every month. Some of us have a car payment that we make every month. And I was thinking about that. What if somebody came and in a once-for-all payment paid the rest of our mortgage or paid the rest of our car payment or paid the rest of whatever it is that, that we might owe? I said, okay, that's okay, but it breaks down because if we faithfully make our mortgage payments, eventually our mortgage will be paid off. 
That's not true in the sacrificial system. You can give and come and give those sacrifices year after year after year. It's never going to take care of sin. So that illustration breaks down. So I thought, what is something that we pay over and over and over again, and we will always pay over and over? So I was thinking about taxes, income tax, sales tax, property tax, school tax. There's things that they call regulatory and franchise taxes, like on your phone bill and your cable bill. You ever look at that? Nobody knows what those are for, but you've got to pay these things over and over and over and over again. Now imagine if somebody came with a once and for all payment and said, I've taken care of your taxes for the rest of your life. Once and done, once for all, payment done, taken care of. What would your response be? Now you've got lots of extra discretionary money. Many of us might be tempted to say, thanks for making that payment. I can figure out what to do with all this extra money from here. Thanks for doing that for me. I got the rest covered. And that's what we do with Jesus. Thanks for paying the price for my sins. I've got this whole life thing figured out. I'll let you know if I need you. If somebody came and paid your taxes, somebody came and took care of that for you, and they would come and, and then say, now let me tell you and give you some instruction about how you are now to live with all that money that you're going to have at your disposal. I would hope we would listen. That's what the author does here. Therefore, here's how you should live. Pay attention to the way that you should live. It's not thanks for doing this and off we go. So here's what he said in verse 19. Therefore, and before he's going to tell us what to do, he repeats again what Jesus has done for us, and it's a wonderful mix of Old Testament and Old Covenant language mixed in with our New Covenant and New Testament the theological way of thinking. It's wonderfully and very well written. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. The priest had bells tied around his ankle so that they could know that he was still alive. He didn't have a whole lot of confidence when he went in to make those sacrifices. But now because of Jesus, we can enter with confidence. We can draw near with confidence by the new and living way that's open for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, here's what we are to do. Three thoughts. First, let us draw near. Don't just say, thanks for what you've done for me. I've got it from here. God sacrificed and saved us because he wants to be in relationship with you and I. So he says, draw near to God. Draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Wonderful description using Old Testament image, imagery to describe what he's done for us. Let us with confidence draw near. Notice what he says. He doesn't come and say, I want you as an individual Christian to draw near to God. No, he says, let us. No Lone Ranger Christians, let us do this together. Let us draw near to God. Not live how we want, but here's how we are to live in response to the sacrifice that he's made. And there is a corporate aspect of that. There is a collective aspect of he's not only broken down the walls and the barriers between us and God, he's broken down the walls and the barriers between each other. So we should all come together, different ages, Male, female, different races, ethnicities, all coming together because he's broken down those walls and those barriers. It's one of the reasons we all gather here on a Sunday morning. But there is also an individual aspect of this drawing near that will look a little bit different for each of us. He encourages us to draw near through prayer, to draw near through the word of God, to draw near even as you experience his creation. Now, you don't go out and experience his creation to just marvel at the creation, you marvel at the creator who has made that. And drawing near can look a little bit different for each of us. 
It's another way of saying our first value statement of loving God, draw near to God. There's a personal aspect and a collective aspect. We want to equip you and prepare you and help you to know how to know God more personally. That's why we want to equip you to read and study the scripture for yourself. But we also want you to come and to gather and to worship him collectively. There's something I hope it's refreshing for your soul to come and to gather with God's people in the way that we do here each Sunday morning, and in the other ways that you gather with one another. Verse 23, let us hold fast, so we are to draw near, but we are also to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. To hold fast, it means to keep a tight grip and to do that without wavering. It's a reminder of the intentionality that we need in the Christian life. Don't just go through the motions or you will drift, but hold fast. And you're holding fast not just to the hope that we have in Jesus, but notice what it says. Hold fast to the confession of our hope. It's something that we talk about, something that we share, something that should be a natural part of our conversations. Not in an obnoxious type of a way, but we keep proclaiming and we keep talking about the hope that we have in Jesus. It's why I keep preaching each and every week the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we don't want anything to get in the way of that. It's a scary thing to get inside my head, but let me give you just a little bit of a glimpse. Sometimes I pull back when I'm preparing messages and I say, you know what? I feel like I'm just saying the same thing over and over and over again. Here's the gospel. Here's a biblical worldview. Live your life from that perspective. Mix in a couple illustrations, help you understand what God's word is saying, and now go and live it. But that's what we're supposed to do. And if we're left to ourselves, that's when we drift. So I hope that you make it a priority to come and to be a part and, and to sit under the teaching of God's word. I'm going to talk about, more about that in just a moment. It's why I keep preaching because I'm holding fast to the confession of that hope. But we also do that personally and individually in our own lives. Some of you remember a baptism of a young adult a couple weeks ago. Her name is Tony, and she started her testimony this way. I just love it. She said, my name is Tony. I go to Westchester University. I'm a history major. I love musicals. I love singing and reading, and I love Jesus. It was just a natural part of her description of who she is. From that one sentence, you just learned a whole lot about her. Round about what her age is, she goes to Westchester University, she likes musicals, she likes to read, she likes to sing, and she loves Jesus. She is holding fast to the confession of the hope that she has because she's talking about it. Are you drawing near? Are you holding fast? And finally, are you considering each other, considering one another? To consider means to think deeply and carefully. Many of us think deeply and carefully about ourselves, but because of who we are called to be as Christians, we should think deeply and carefully about each other. We should not stop meeting together, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. What are we supposed to do when we come and we gather together? Instead of neglecting to meet, when we come together, he tells us that really we should be doing two things. First, we should be stirring up one another to love and good works. It's a strong word to stir up. It's normally used in a negative context. It can mean to provoke or to irritate to get something moving. So he uses this word with a negative connotation to say we need to, there's times in our life we need to provoke and irritate and agitate one another towards love and good works, to, to activate love in our lives. We were talking about this in staff devotions this week and somebody said it's like an agitator in a washing machine. I said that's a great illustration. Now some of you, you hear the words provoke, irritate, agitate, and you say I have that spiritual gift. I know how to irritate and aggravate and agitate other people. Now I've got a Bible verse to support it. No, 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 no. We are spurring one another on, stirring one another up. If need be, we need to speak deeply into one another's lives 
to encourage the love and good works that should be produced. Do you have a person like this in your life? Do you have a person in your life that if need be, they will get in your face? I don't want to hear any more stories of somebody's marriage falling apart or somebody falling into sin and somebody says, yeah, I suspected that they were having some problems. I just didn't want to get involved. No, 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 no. That shouldn't happen in the body of Christ. There should be people that have close enough relationship to you that if you're going to start sinning, they're going to chase after you and not let it happen. It's what it means to stir up one another. But we're not only stirring up one another, look what it says at the end, we're encouraging one another. Do you know the difference? Do you know when somebody needs stirred up in their life and do you know when somebody needs encouraged in, your, in their life? If somebody is down and, and needs to be encouraged and you try to stir them up, you might do more harm than good. We've got to both stir up and we have to encourage. And then right back to what it says in the middle. This happens because we're not neglecting to meet together. Apparently, they stopped getting together. They stopped having that fellowship. They stopped coming together for worship. They stopped coming together for accountability. And it actually became a habit in their life. It doesn't take long to develop a habit. It doesn't take long for your life to get so busy with all that you're doing and all that you're trying to accomplish, and then what gets pushed out are those intentional relationships that you have with other people that you need in your life. Sometimes people fill their weekend with so many different things that you know what gets set aside? Well, let's just sleep in on Sunday morning. Now, that's not a pitch and that's not a plea for you to come to church here at Calvary Church. I think there's great value in coming together in a setting like this. And if you're suspicious of me saying that, I want you to know I love the local church just as much as I love Calvary Church. And if that's not happening for you here at Calvary Church, we will help you find a church where that is happening. I care about people being involved and connected in the local church. You shouldn't neglect meeting together as a body in a local church, but you also shouldn't neglect meeting with that smaller group of people. Small group, accountability, ABF, whatever it might be. Many of you could stand up here and give testimony today how when you've gone through a difficult time because you've had people there, they've been able to walk you through that. No lone ranger Christians in the body of Christ. This week I was thinking about this and I took a quote from John Piper and I took a quote from Paul Tripp, and I mesh them together, and here's what I come up with when it talks about being involved in one another's lives. We need to be intentionally intrusive, Christ-centered, grace-driven, faith-building, redemptive togetherness. That's just another way of saying what the writer of Hebrews is saying right here. Now, what's important is you can't have one without the other. You can't say, I'm just going to be intentionally intrusive in people's lives, some of you love to be intentionally intrusive in other people's lives and get into their business and find out what's going on and start gossip and start rumors and whatever. No, no, to be intentionally intrusive means we're, we're digging in. We have deep and real relationships with them. They're Christ-centered relationships. We're not just getting together to watch football or the Food Network or talk about The Walking Dead or whatever your favorite TV show might be, but there's a Christ-centeredness in our relationships. There's an aspect of our relationships, really all of our relationships should be grace-driven. Are your relationships marked by grace? Some of us have relationships that are marked by people that are judgmental and critical, and they're just trying to make everybody else just like them. Do you have relationships that are faith-building, growing, maturing, building up, helping one another to draw near and to hold fast? And finally, do you have redemptive togetherness. There are hurts and pains and hard things in life, and when we come together in redemptive community, we help redeem those difficult things that we're going through in life. Is this a reality for you? Do you draw near? Are you holding fast? Are you considering one another in intentionally intrusive, Christ-centered, grace-driven, faith-building, redemptive togetherness? Wouldn't it be great if this chapter and this section just kind of ended right there? So encouraging. What Jesus had done, the community that we're supposed to live in, but he doesn't end there. He goes on with a warning. 
And he talks about the return and the soon-to-come judge. And here's what he says in verse 26. If we go on sinning deliberately, in chapter 9 he talked about unintentional sins, but if we go on sinning deliberately, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Whoa. That's a warning, huh? You say, oh, I don't want to receive that warning. But it's wonderful that these warnings are there. They're real warnings, and they're there to help keep us on track. This deliberate sinning is talking about a deliberate turning away from that once and for all sacrifice that Jesus has accomplished for us. Have you seen all that Jesus has done? Don't turn your back on it. He paid your taxes. Why would you go back and then trample on the payment that he's made? All of the riches of Christ are available to you. Why would you ever go back? As we talked about in chapter 6, People have talked about different ways to interpret these warnings. Some say, oh, these are people that are genuinely saved, and if they deliberately turn back, there's no sacrifice left. Others have said that they're not saved, they've just heard the truth, and if they continue to reject, they won't be saved. Others have said, no, this book is written to a group of believers who are genuinely saved, and if they sin deliberately, this is not eternal judgment, but this is judgment and discipline in a, in a temporal nature. However you look at it, it's a real warning that needs to be listened to. Look what John Piper says in talking about the book of Hebrews. The book begins and ends with Christ making purification for sins and sitting down at the right hand of God, our perfect sacrifice and priest and shepherd who will never leave us or forsake us. We've talked about that all over these last six weeks. But then he says this, this is what I want you to pay attention to. But like no other book of the New Testament, this book is also relentless in its warnings about the dangers of carelessness in the Christian life. And we need to heed that warning. Are you in a posture of believing and trusting what Jesus has done for you? If the person comes to me and says, oh, I prayed a prayer when I was little, but my life has no evidence of a relationship with Jesus, then I'm going to come to that person with the real warnings of Scripture. But if somebody has a soft conscience and they're afraid that they lose their salvation every time they wake up and step on the, the floor of their bedroom in the morning, I'm going to come to that person and help them to understand what Christ has done and the security and the assurance that they have in Him as they continue to believe. But these warnings are there to warn people. Look what he says in verse 29. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, profaned the blood of the covenant, and by which he was sanctified, and has outraged the Spirit of grace? Did you see that last one? Outraged the Spirit of grace. That's a humbling statement because we don't want to put ourselves in a position where we're cutting ourselves off from the work of the Spirit in our lives. Do you know why? Because it's a fearful thing, verse 31, to fall into the hands of a living God. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, because he is our advocate, we fall into his hands and what he has done for us. He ends with some great encouragement, verse 32. But I want you to recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering. Some of you remember what it was like when you first trusted in Jesus Christ. It's a good thing to reflect back and to think about those days. You have a need of endurance. Continue to press on. Continue to persevere. And he comes to the end of the chapter in verse 39 and he gives us great word of encouragement. But we are not of those who shrink back. I know better of you. You're not going to shrink back. But you're of those who have faith and preserve their souls. You're going to press on. 
you are going to continue to be captivated by Christ, let me end with this very brief illustration. It may not be helpful to you. It does help me. I don't like roller coasters. Messes with my head, messes with my vertigo. My kids love them. We use that as a metaphor for life, don't we? Life is like a roller coaster. Ups and downs and twists and turns. Sometimes we feel nauseous when we go through the twists and turns of life. And if we're not careful, we might think when we're told to hold fast and grab hold, that we might think that we're on a roller coaster ride of life and we're not strapped into the car, we're just kind of holding on to a handle and off we go through life. And if we let go, we feel like we're going to be done for. But if you extend the analogy... Life is a roller coaster. But what we have in Jesus Christ is the opportunity to get into that car, for that lap belt to come across, for that harness to come down over us, to be sealed in what Jesus Christ has done for us. And as he is holding on to us, we are holding fast on to him. I don't know about you, but I'm not one that rides roller coasters and puts my hands up in the air. I am holding fast to that harness that's holding on to me. To me, that's a wonderful picture of the Christian life. Life is filled with ups and downs and roller coasters and twists and turns. But we have the opportunity to be in Christ, to be strapped into who he is and to what he has done. And for his life to be lived through us, and we draw near to him. We hold fast to him. And guess what? We're not on that ride alone. We're considering one another and we're doing it together. We're heeding the, war the real warnings that he gives to us. But we're grabbing hold of him as we're going through this life that he has given to us. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we covered lots of ground today. Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice. Being able to be reminded and remember that through communion. Being challenged with how to live life, hearing those real warnings, but being encouraged to continue to persevere. Father, may that be true of each and every one of us. Here at Calvary Church, those listening to my voice right now, thank you for what you've done. May we continue to have a posture of belief and of trust because you have a will for us and you are accomplishing your will through the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. And to him be the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for being here today. If you want to connect at the welcome gathering, out the doors down to the right. Lunch is served right now. We'll see you over there. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, a great week. And we'll see you next week for part seven of Captivated. Captivated.